Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Vanessa Tyler, and I'm the local site investigator for the CLSA at Briere Continuing Care and an associate professor in psychology at the University of Ottawa. So I'd like to thank you for attending our May webinar, Long-Term Cognitive Impairment Following Concussion Findings from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Before we begin, uh, I want to acknowledge the heartbreaking news out of British Columbia last week and recognize the painful legacy of residential schools and the importance of honoring the 215 children who never returned home from the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that the CLSA National Coordinating Center is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. I'm speaking to you all from the University of Ottawa, which is situated on the traditional lands of the Algonquin people. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory which remains unseated. As attendees of this webinar, I encourage you to learn more and to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the lands where we currently have the privilege to research, live and work, wherever that may be. Uh, it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce today's webinar entitled Long-Term Cognitive Impairment Following Concussion Findings from the CLSA, presented by uh, my PhD student, Mark Bedard. So Mark holds a BA in psychology and MSc in neuroscience from Carleton University. And he's currently a PhD candidate just finishing up in clinical psychology at the University of Ottawa, where he's working toward developing competency in both clinical psychology and clinical neuropsychology. And Mark is a Vanier scholar supported by the CIHR and his doctoral research examined the long-term impact cognitive function following concussion. He's published a number of articles in peer-reviewed journals and presented his work at international conferences, and his pre-doctoral research examined the impact of chemotherapy treatments on cognitive function in breast cancer survivors. So now it is my great pleasure to pass it along to Mark. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's uh, so great to meet everyone here. It's uh, a huge pleasure to be able to be at this point uh, to share with you some of the findings from my dissertation, which uh, I'm very fortunate to have defended back in February. Ultimately, too, I think uh, a great opportunity to showcase um, what the CLSA can can be used towards. Um, so how some of the data can actually be you know, leveraged in a way and what findings we can have come from it. Uh, I approached uh, some of the data from a very interesting angle. I've I've always had a uh, a large interest in looking at uh, long-term functioning following concussion. I've had a couple in my past. I've known some people that have had some different head injuries. And so um, one of the big uh, questions that I had was, you know, does a concussion lead to long-term uh, impacts as far as cognitive functioning? Um, and, and ultimately, as we get older, right, do, you know, what does this mean for, for long-term aging? Um, so these were some of the questions that I was uh, wrestling with with, uh, with my dissertation. Um, let's see. So I don't know if I have access, uh, surely to the, um, the slides. Do I need to. Yeah, you're yeah, good to go. You have access. Good. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, so. I guess I just have to click. I can't use my keyboard. Um, so 1st thing I, I just did a bit of a purse. Uh, cursory look at um, some of the epide epidemiology around TBI, so traumatic brain injuries in general. And they seem to be a really big phenomenon for younger Canadians, younger individuals, um, tend to come on uh, as well in that sort of younger adulthood where, you know, people are starting to engage in sports, they might be driving for the first time, kind of really busy lifestyles. Um, and then beyond that, they seem to be a phenomenon in older age uh, where balance and um, the ability to ambulate is a little bit more challenging. Uh, certainly in, you know, in the Canadian context with winters, with ice, lots of hazards at play. Um, and so with the increasing frailty that we might experience in older age, um, it seems to be an area, uh, uh, an, uh, an area in life when people are having head injuries. Um, so these are, you know, pretty common affairs. Um, in fact, many of us may have, you know, had a head injury in our past. And so it's a, it's a really important research question as far as looking at the, the long term impacts of head injury and what this might mean as we get older. Um, ultimately, what I was most curious in is, you know, what we call concussion, uh, 
but the research literature calls mild traumatic brain injury, so MTBI. And so really it's uh, on the lower end of head injuries. So where we might have had some kind of unconsciousness, but it didn't take up very much time, less than 30 minutes, might have had some kind of amnesia, like difficulty remembering events in and around the head injury, might have some kind of altered mental status, some kind of like neurological deficit. So maybe a sensitivity to light or to smell, these kinds of things. And, and ultimately, you know, if, if someone is presented to hospital, they would use the Glasgow Coma Scale Score. So scale scores are 13 or higher, which means that the person, um, you know, is pretty aware, they can respond to questions, um, you know, as far as um, their sort of consciousness when they get to hospital, it's, it's there. Um, no real difficulties with that. Um, now, here's the thing. Research literature examining long-term cognitive you know, impacts of concussion and, or sorry, of traumatic brain injury have, have mostly looked at um, more moderate and severe traumatic brain injuries. So there's a huge amount of literature out there that has examined, you know, these types of individuals who may have been unconscious for a day or two in hospital for longer periods of time. Um, and so the, a big piece of the puzzle was, was missing as far as looking at the long-term impacts of mild traumatic brain injuries, which were actually one of the most more common types of head injuries. Um, so I was really interested in this. And, you know, ultimately, when, when, um, when we look at some of the, the neuroimaging findings around mild traumatic brain injuries, um, we're talking about changes in the frontal part of the brain. Um, so this part of the brain is really important for um, personality. Um, parts of it are important for um, our ability to, you know, be awake and to have some, some level of consciousness. And a big piece around the frontal part of the brain, too, is it, it acts as like a, an executive you know, over overriding control on on general cognitive functions. So it's really it's a really important area of the brain um, as far as cognitive functioning is concerned. And so when we have a concussion, just very generally kind of cursory overlook on it, um, we might have some kind of impact, possibly some kind of rotational forces if the person was spinning. But ultimately, what we're talking about is is changes on more of the microscopic level where we might have brain cells or the cell body and this kind of longer axon, this like tail that then connects with other brain cells. And, you know, the brain's got a lot of brain cells. We're talking about 100 billion neurons, 100 billion brain cells. Um, but what can happen after a concussion is that some of these brain cells, the fatty part of that tail that really helps with the communication can shear. So this is axonal shearing. And this is really common after um, someone experiences a mild traumatic brain injury, and especially so when they've experienced an MTBI with loss of consciousness. And so this is what some of the, the imaging studies have shown is that we'll find some axonal shearing and we'll find some changes in frontal parts of the brain. So what does this mean? Uh, well, the frontal part of the brain, as I mentioned, is really there is this kind of like overriding, um, you know, control center for a lot of cognitive functionings. And when we start talking at that level, we're really talking about executive functioning, ability to plan, to organize, to problem solve, to inhibit responses like impulse control, um, set shifting. This is kind of that multi um, multitasking kind of piece. Can we switch between different things flexibly? Or are we a little bit more rigid and get stuck if the, you know, the, the whatever the environment we find ourselves in changes, can we adapt? Um, and these kinds of executive functions are really important for what's called prospective memory. So this is our ability to remember to remember. So the fact that we all knew that we had this webinar and to organize ourselves to be here to attend it. And so when we talk about prospective memory, we can really break it down as far as how is it that we remember to remember? And so sometimes this can be event based, in which case there's some kind of external cue. So maybe this is like a calendar reminder. Or it could be a little bit more time based, which is more self initiated. So we don't necessarily have that external cue, but we rely on internal cues to try to remind ourselves that we, we have to do something. Um, and so it's more time and, and, uh, and cognitively intensive. It tasks more onto the executive functions. Um, looking out, though, as far as what cognitive functioning uh, is following MTBI. There have been a lot of different research studies, uh, really more recently, um, in a few meta analyses that have you know cataloged these kinds of things. So meta analyses to make sense uh, of what the overarching literature tends to show. Some of those early meta analyses, though, were 
saying that people tend to get better right around three months. So if you have a head injury, if you have a concussion, give it some time. And, you know, if you look again in three months, odds are you should be back to normal. Um, but um, what some of the more recent meta-analyses are suggesting is that those earlier meta-analyses were actually just obscuring a small subset of people that tend to actually continue to have impairment long after the head injury. And um, so this was really interesting. You know, it's maybe not the case that everyone who has had a concussion will have long-term changes and long-term impairment, but there are certainly a group of people that do. And so what's different about them? And so this is where I was really intrigued. So uh, CLSA, uh, a really wonderful reservoir of data. Of course, it's longitudinal assessing individuals between the ages of 45 and 85 every three years and for at least 20 years. And there are those two assessment streams tracking more of that telephone follow up and comprehensive um, where uh, individuals are followed uh, at 11 data collection sites across Canada. And so there's more of an in person aspect, extensive assessment, biological samples. And in my case, which I, which I was really excited by is that there's some neuropsychological testing as well that happens. Um, I was also fortunate for my dissertation to have access to both the baseline data, that first wave, and the second wave follow up data. So um, when I go in to start talking about what my research looked like, um, I have a couple studies. And so some are focused more on the baseline, and the, there'll be a third study that, that focuses on, uh, on that follow up as well. So as far as my primary measures, um, sort of uh, background information was looking at age, sex, gender, education, which I had recoded for more of an international readership and publication. Um, so I, I recoded the, the education to kind of fall within those sorts of categories. Um, also had access to the um, brief traumatic brain injury screen, which includes a lot of different items within it. But most of most interest to me was this loss of consciousness uh, variable. And so they categorize it based on these three different levels. Um, obviously, when we're talking about mild traumatic brain injury, some of these individuals will fall in this greater than 20 minutes, but also um, it could be, it could also include some of those more moderate to severe. So we did exclude these individuals um, and really just focused on the one to 20 minutes unconscious and less than one minute unconscious. Um, looked at depression as well. So the CESD is a really useful scale. It's it's often used in research to look at and, and, and make sense of depressive experiences um, and uh, testing language. So whether individuals were tested on those neuropsychological tests in, in English or in French. Um, I also looked at alcohol frequency. So there's a variable within the CLSA that, uh, that looks at alcohol. Um, a couple others as well, but these were the primary ones. Those are the ones that I was most interested in. As far as um, the neuropsychological aspect, um, the CLSA uses the Miami Prospect of Memory Test. So there are two different tasks, one more event-based, the other more time-based. So with the event-based one, the examiner prompts the participant um, to then reach over to an envelope where the, the examinee, the participant, will, will have to, their, their task with giving the examiner from that envelope with a bunch of different bills, a $5 bill and to keep a $10 bill. So there's an envelope with a bunch of different denominations. They have to remember to do this. And it happens, you know, some minutes after they start um, the cognitive testing. And then 15 minutes after the, this test is started, they also have to self-initiate this time-based activity to grab an envelope with a bunch of different numbered playing cards and select the, the number 17 to hand this to, um, to the examiner. So there's some different aspects of, uh, of this prospective memory task. And ultimately, it's scored based on three different uh, facets or, or, or aspects. Um, the intention to perform, did they actually remember that they were supposed to do something? Accuracy, did they remember what it was that they were supposed to do? And need for reminders, like did they really need some help to remember that they needed to do something in the first place? And so ultimately, these um, for each event-based, each time-based, each one of these is scored on three, so a total of nine points for event, nine points for time-based. Um, as far as the other executive functioning or other cognitive measures, we had the Controlled Oral Word Association Test, FAS. Um, examinee needs to say as many words that come to mind within like a 60-second period um, for each of those letters. 
animal fluency, examining needs to identify and name out as quickly as it can the uh, all the animals that come to mind. Mental alternation tests, the, the examinee is flipping between in increasing sequence, numbers and letters, up the alphabet, up the number chain, um, jumping back and forth. So a lot of set shifting with this one. And the Stroop test, um, really interesting test of inhibition and flexibility. Um, feel free to look that one up online, it's really cool. Uh, and then we had some tests of long-term memory as well. So the Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test. Um, so asking, uh, telling the examinee, um, I think 15 words, reading them out, and then having the examinee um, repeat as many of those 15 words as they can. So one's done right after presentation, the other one's done some minutes later as more of a delayed recall. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, really interested in looking at the mild traumatic brain injury piece. We did exclude people that had some kind of neurological disease, uh, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, central nervous system cancers, stroke, transient ischemic attack, which is like a mini stroke, any brain injury or multiple injuries, which can include brain injury in the past 12 months. These people were excluded as well. Um, and any missingness, so we did a listwise deletion on any missingness uh, across the data set. So ultimately what we had were people with MTBI that had had some kind of brain injury, a head injury um, more than 12 months ago with a loss of consciousness um, and really only looked at people that had only one head injury, one brain injury. Um, so isolating for a single lifetime concussion that occurred more than a year ago. And as I mentioned, we removed the people that had uh, reported potentially long loss of consciousness. So ultimately, this was our, our this was our distilled baseline sample. Um, so quite a sizable uh, sample to work with, which I was um, really excited by. Um, ultimately, in this first study, looking at the baseline data, really interested in looking at that prospective memory test, right? So it's really sensitive to, to, to changes in executive functioning, executive functioning being subserved by the frontal lobe, which we know that those neuroimaging studies tend to show some changes in. Um, so I ran a repeated measures ANCOVA um, to look at group differences on that prospective memory test, and I controlled for age, education, sex, depression, uh, alcohol frequency, testing language, so trying to remove some of those other confounding variables ultimately to distill whether, you know, having had an MTBI with loss of consciousness in the past um, means that we're maybe predisposed or more likely to experience um, some kinds of deficits in prospective memory. Um, and so, you know, we also had some additional analysis as part of that uh, repeated measures and COVA to really break it down to understand is that if there are some changes, is it more in that time-based or more the event-based functioning? Um, and then beyond that, right? So I talked about those meta-analyses and it seems to be like a subgroup of people that tend to have impairment. So I ran um, some, some pretty interesting analyses to really break it down so that we can isolate people that we would consider more impaired. Um, and so by that, it's scoring two or more standard deviations below the mean of the control group for that time and event-based uh, prospective memory functioning task. So we're talking about like, you know, we're not just saying like people that have made like a mistake, they're, they're like sig significant mistakes. Um, so they're really quite markedly, you know, at a deficit as compared to the compare group comparison group. Okay. Um, a lot of data here that I presented, but ultimately to say that the, you know, each of these different groups were largely the same. Um, uh, some differences popped up in depression. So controls were generally speaking, reported less depression than the other two groups. But we can see here that the means are relatively close. Standard deviations are also pretty close. So not super, um, you know, not, not, a, not a huge effect here, but the controls did have a larger proportion of females as a, a relative to males. The inverse was found for the, the other two groups. So at any rate, we, we did control for these factors, but these, you know, these are important pieces to keep in mind when, uh, when making sense of the results. Um, so this is a table that, you know, really highlights um, the results from that repeated measures and COVA and from those, you know, two standard deviation impairment rate analyses. So ultimately what we have here are some um, small but significant changes as far as time-based functioning is concerned. So really popping up for those that, that reported um, either sets of unconsciousness, 
So ultimately, people that have had an MTBI more than a year ago that report some loss of consciousness in this study tended to score lower on the time-based um, measure of the um, of the my, of that prospective memory task. Um, that wasn't found for the event-based functioning. And when we look at the errors, it seemed to pop up more with the intention to perform. So a failure in their in their ability to remember to remember to do something. It's not that they forgot what it is that they were supposed to do. Um, there was just a breakdown in that process, in that self-initiated process to get them to the point where they can, you know, actually grab that envelope um, and, and grab the items and hand it to the examiner. Where it got really interesting, though, is when we looked at the impairment rates, right? So scoring two or more standard deviations below the mean of the control group. Um, really, it's this group that reported more loss of consciousness that were quite a bit more likely to be impaired on time-based functioning relative to those that reported less unconsciousness and certainly less than the time or than the uh, control group. And then we're talking almost like 50% more likely. It's quite a quite a striking um, difference that's emerged there. Um, so this study was really interesting. This was the first one that I worked on with CLSA data, really excited by those findings. Uh, and then I really wanted to see, okay, so prospective memory we know is super um, influenced by executive functioning, but what processes in executive functioning tend to be um, more impaired or more implicated in MTBI? And again, let's look at you know the declarative memory. Let's look at that long-term memory piece. Let's have a look at whether you know people's verbal long-term memory seems to be you know implicated at all as well. So that was the focus of my second study. Um, so as far as analyses, um, a multivariate uh, analysis of covariance. So looking at the relation across all those different cognitive um, tests. Again, controlling for age, education, sex, depression, alcohol, testing language, same covariates as before. And I also ran some different impairment analyses. This time, uh, you know, scoring uh, um, one and a half or more standard deviations below that control group, um, which we had adjusted for age and education. Uh, and ultimately chose a, a more uh, liberal um, standard deviation this time because I did some further analyses to group up those different test scores. Um, as people have also done in the case of like mild cognitive impairment, uh, if you're at all uh, done or have looked at that kind of research, um, might end up looking at a couple different tests um, to see if it's more like scoring at that level of impairment on two or more different tests. So to really kind of hammer home that we're talking about someone who has um, a pretty consistent level of impairment. Um, and I broke it down based on, you know, two levels of impairment or two domains. So grouped up the executive functioning tests and those two um, tests of declarative memory, of long-term memory. Um, so ultimately trying to see whether people tend to be more impaired on individual tests of executive functioning and verbal memory, or if we group them up, does there tend to be like a more consistent picture of impairment? And is it more one or the other? So uh, as far as the results from that second study, um, again, we have the results here. I've, I've broken it down based on domain. So results from that Mancova here, and then as well here, when we look at the raw scores, ultimately um, not really any significant changes on that group a group mean level. And I think this is this is consistent with what the um with what those earlier meta-analyses would say. When we have grouped level mean changes, we don't tend to really find a lot of difference. Um, a slight difference here is a bit of um an anomaly as far as the um the group with the lower, the 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 less amount of loss of consciousness tending to score a little bit higher on this animal fluency test um, for for you know, an interesting reason, I'm not even quite sure what what explains this, but, you know, we're also talking about really small effect sizes, so it's not super meaningful um, in the larger scope of things. Generally speaking, these groups are, even though significant at the P level, um, you know, meaningfulness, um, it's not exactly there. 
However, um, what does seem to be there from both a P level and meaningful on the effect size piece of things uh, are these impairment analyses. So, um, the group that reported more loss of consciousness, um, quite a bit more impaired on that verbal learning test, the declarative memory. Um, and, and we're talking here, like, you know, a little bit under twice as much. Um, so it's, it's quite a big change as compared to the control group and the, the, the less than 1 minute group. Where we also found some significant, uh, significant differences again, with this, you know, more, uh, loss of consciousness group, uh, was in the mental alternation test. So that's that test where they had to jump between a number and a letter up in sequence. Uh, as many times as they can within a minute. It's actually a little bit of a challenging task. Um, requires a lot of efficiency and set shifting. Um, and that uh, verbal fluency task, you know, recalling as many words as they can that begin at the letter F and S within 60 seconds as quickly as they can, as many as they can. Um, so these two domains of executive functioning, these two processes in executive functioning seem to be um, areas of, of particular impairment. Um, in that higher loss of consciousness group, as compared to the lower loss of consciousness group and that control group. When we break it down or group it into that two test impairment, again, the same sort of picture um, shows up. Okay. Um, for my third study, I'm, I'm going to just present some abbreviated findings. Uh, we did also do some other stuff to look at, um, you know, aspects of cognitive reserve, which is a really neat area of the literature. Um, I thought I would keep this presentation a little bit shorter, so I'm, I'm omitting that. Um, but you're more than welcome to have a look at the original source article if you have access to it. Um, because uh, cognitive reserve um, is this really cool area of the research that is really coming and, and taking, um, uh, it's coming, you know, and becoming really popular. Um, so aspects either of our lived environment or maybe of our like formal education um, that might actually help protect against and buffer against increasing age or, you know, increasing brain pathology. So in the case of like a traumatic brain injury, um, in the case of any kind of like central nervous system changes, like neurological deficits from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, cognitive reserve is is really quite um, quite huge in 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 those areas, uh, but I've left it out here um, just to keep it on on cognitive functioning a little bit more um, precisely. But I'm more than happy to talk about that those results too if there's any questions. Um, what I wanted to do in this third study um, with the second wave data is to understand whether so. From the, the first two studies, we know that there's a small group of people that tend to have long term deficits in executive functioning and in some cases in, in verbal memory as well. Um, so we have this group of people, but what does it mean in the larger scope of MTBI when we look again three years later? Do people tend to get better? Uh, does cognitive functioning deteriorate or do they tend to stay the same? Um, so this is what I was really kind of focusing on. Um, there's been some, you know, look at the some some research studies have found that um, you know head injuries, particularly more um, severe head injuries, might actually predispose or start a cascade of brain changes that can initiate a cognitive deterioration towards, in in some cases, dementia, but certainly, um, you know, more of a longer term change on the negative end as far as cognitive performance. Um, so I was really interested in looking at whether a single head injury with some level of loss of consciousness um, might actually lead to any kind of change in the longer term. Should we actually be concerned for some of these people um, that, that are reporting some significant differences? Um, what does it mean? Um, so that's why I used a reliable change indices. I'll talk a little bit more about that because it's um, a really cool analysis that you can run when you've got you know, pre and post or wave one, wave two. Um, ultimately, what a reliable change index does is to try to understand whether uh, a second set of scores is reliably different or significantly different from a first set of analyses 
accounting for measurement error. So the fact that, you know, if I were to ask you to uh, recall as many Canadian prime ministers as you can, um, that you're probably going to have a different number today versus if I were to ask you in like a week. Um, so there's always a bit of measurement error and the reliable change indices can help protect against that um, and also protect against the fact of or the effect of practice effects. So naturally, when you're more familiar, when you've done something once, it's going to be easier the second time around. And so this kind of thing in cognitive functioning is, is super well documented, um, but the reliable chain indices can help protect against some of these influences. So ultimately to have a little bit more of an assertion that if we see a change at time two, it's because time two scores really are different um, from time one. Um, and so how we, um, how we categorize that improvement or decline in the RCI literature is to take a Z score of um, 1.645 plus or minus. So if they fall between these two, you know, sort of cutoffs, then, then we can say it's no change. But scoring greater than 1.645 means that there's some kind of improvement. Scoring less than the negative says that there's a reliable decline. So this is what that equation looks like. Essentially, each participant will have had, a, you know, their first test scores and their second test scores. So taking uh, the difference between the two and then also subtracting the uh, mean of that second uh, of, of the entire group uh, at the second test uh, time minus the mean at the first test taking time and then dividing it by the standard error of the difference. So a standard deviation of the difference between these two means. Um, and ultimately, this allows us to remove the influence of practice effects, and it allows us to remove the influence of, um, of, of measurement error. Um, so that it's not just a simple case of, um, of, you know, seeing that maybe this time two score is lower than the time one, but it's not due, it's, it's more than that. Um, it's beyond what people generally tend to have as far as their, you know, second time point score relative to their first time point score. Uh, and again, we're talking about, you know, some pretty big changes. So to reliably say that there's some improvement means that the person at T2 would have really outperformed their T1 uh, scores. And likewise with the decline, really did significantly worse the second time around as compared to the first time relative to what the, you know, average amount of change would be found across the sample. And this mean two, mean one, this is of the control group as with the standard error difference. When I um, graph out the reliable change scores, so this is before I've categorized impairment and uh, decline, this is uh, what it's looked like. And this sort of darker hashed off um, these bars here are for those that have had loss of consciousness 1 to 20 minutes. The striped lighter one is for loss of consciousness less than 1 minute. And what's super faint and hard to see are just super black small error bars or and bars right along the zero line. Uh, that's the control group. So, which makes sense. The control group ought to not have a whole lot of change. Um, they are the index upon which we are comparing the two other groups to. And so on the left side, if the bar is jetting out closer into the negatives, obviously, you know, it suggests that people tend to um, perform worse at the second time point relative to the first. Whereas if we start seeing some bars popping up on the right side, they tended to do a little bit better the second time around as compared to the first. And I have this, you know, these error bars around um, these these point scores here to just kind of show where you know most of the people tended to fall. Um, so where I was really being pulled towards. Um, so some interesting findings. Um, you know, in the case of loss of consciousness, one to twenty minutes, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, but um, we also have to acknowledge that we haven't done that impairment rate yet. And so although it's the case that in some cases people tend to deteriorate. Other people tend to improve. Um, what is this actually? Is this a real significant change relative to the control group? And, and likewise, if we were to like hone down, 
to uh, a small subset of people that have improved versus a small subset of people that have declined. Um, you know, it, is that really a, a big change or a big difference uh, as compared to the control group? So that's what the this next set, this next table here demonstrates. Um, so I, I did also run some additional analyses looking at time one, time two scores. Not a heck of a lot of change on that group mean level analysis. Um, and so I also present that here for the declarative memory, again, breaking it down by cognitive domain. But it does get interesting when we start to look at the impairment and the improved. So after calculating those Z scores and really dichotomizing participants into, um, into either improved or deteriorated or no change. And so here I'm presenting the, the dichotomy between improved, uh, sorry, on the left side, you'll see declined and on the right side, you will see improved um, reliably. So um, the only ones that really came up as significant uh, were in the group that reported more loss of consciousness and um, in a couple areas, it was really just declined. So significant decline in the mental alternation test as compared to the two other groups, which didn't differ from each other uh, and in animal fluency, again, compared to the two other groups. And so when we, when I categorize sort of a global decline versus improvement, so just looking across all the different tests, if they declined on two or more tests or improved on two or more tests, again, that same story came out. Um, the people that reported more loss of consciousness were more likely to have exhibited decline uh, relative uh, to the two other groups. So 10% so of people that have had a single head injury with not a lot of loss of consciousness, one to 20 minutes, um, you know, three years after that first assessment tended to get worse. There tended to be some deterioration. So as far as what my dissertation is showing um, is that, of course, MTBIs are really common. Um, it, it's common that any one of us of the, you know, 60 people that are in here today um, might end up having a head injury in the near term. But um, I think it's important to recognize that although most people will uh, improve and get back to back to normal after a few months, there are a small group of people that tend to have lingering difficulties that tend to continue to suffer as far as their cognitive functioning is concerned. And what this seems to be the case for are those people that report loss of consciousness and particularly when there's more loss of consciousness. Um, so we found that there was lower time-based prospect of memory functioning um, at some point after, you know, a year later, at least a year later. Um, those errors tended to indicate that it was more about a difficulty to remember to remember. That longer time loss of consciousness tends to be most implicated or most, most likely a candidate. There's something going on with these folks. Um, that there's also the case of you know, deficits in, in verbal memory, long-term verbal memory. Uh, and they, these aspects of cognitive control and set shifting, right? That mental alternation past. When we look at a three-year window and we look again three years later, um, right, that 10% that of people on sort of globally indexed cognitive functioning do, do show some deterioration. So there's, there's something to be said uh, about mild traumatic brain injuries um, that it's it's not just uh, you know get back up and, and get back and play. Um, in the case of a sports injury, um, it really is something to to be careful about and, and to try to understand a little bit more. Um, certainly, in the case of uh, uh, of people who might be you know working and, and needing to manage a lot in their day to day lives, but there's something to be said too about what it means for us as we as we age. Um, and so to be aware of this. And um, so some of this research I think has some you know, real world applications for primary care, um, but also to, to help inform the, the next set of researchers um, who can take this, um, that next step forward. Um, and so to understand a little bit more about what it is that these people, what it is about these, these people um, that might help to, you know, flush out the deterioration versus improvement uh, and what kinds of things can we do to help support these people? Um, so ultimately, um, it's nothing that we necessarily need to be concerned of as Canadians who tend to have head injuries from time to time, as with the rest of the world. Um, but to recognize that there are going to be a small group of people 
that might complain about some difficulties in their cognitive functioning and not to dismiss those concerns that they are real, that there are a small group of people that have difficulties. And so to recognize that to be so. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'd love to open this up for any questions. If you have any, um, I am happy to answer questions either about um, my profession in clinical psychology, clinical neuropsychology, about the data, uh, about the results, um, anything at all. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, for your excellent presentation. So, uh, as Mark said, we uh, will open it up for questions now. And I just want to remind you that uh, your muting will remain on. So, if you have questions or comments, feel free to enter them into the chat box in the bottom right corner and I will read them out uh, in the order in which they appear. And then uh, Mark will uh, have a chance to answer them. So feel free to share any questions. I did, I did actually get a, I don't know if you're getting some questions, uh, Dr. Taller, but I did get one sent to me privately. Um, okay, so I, I, I will give a little reminder. That's great if you want to read that out, Mark. And if you guys could uh, sh share them, make sure that you set it to everyone, and then I will read them out, and that way everybody will be able to to see what the questions are. But go ahead, Mark, if you want to tell us what to, what the first question is you got. Sure. Sure, happy to. So uh, I did get in a question here asking what were the etiologies of the TBIs, mm -hmm. balls and BAs, uh, et cetera, and were litigants uh, excluded? Oops, sorry, I just need to close this uh, poll. Yeah, I think that was oh. the the question. Um, so yeah, good, great, great question, right? So um, you know, obviously, when we when we start talking about uh, litigious contexts, we might start talking about people who are concerned about secondary gain. Are they actually giving you know good responses, or are they trying to present themselves in a particular way because of court or money and these kinds of things? So CLSA, um, you know, we're really talking about people that aren't coming in with like a set agenda. Uh, it's really you know, we're talking about people that are but that are being followed as part of this huge data set. Um, so um, we don't have data on litigious status. Um, so we didn't exclude these kinds of individuals, but I think it's also safe to assume that the people that participated in the CLSA weren't doing so for secondary gain as a part of, you know, litigious means, if, if we will. Um, as far as the falls, the etiologies, um, so it really is split. Uh, a big part of this is falls. Naturally, we're talking about older adults. You know, those between the ages of 45 and 85. Mean age across the three, three different groups is like 60, 61. So it's a big part of the head injury. Um, sports related was a big one, um, and vehicle collisions as well. Um, and you know, the thing is, what we what we have as a limitation in front of us is we don't know when the head injury occurred. So we don't know how old they were. We just know that it happened at least a year ago. Um, but uh, but great great question. Hopefully I've answered it uh, to your satisfaction. Uh, thanks, Mark. So the next question is from uh, Alexandra Fiocho, who asks uh, if you could uh, mention whether you examined sex differences in these associations. Yeah, not uh, not explicitly, um, but I, I did do some secondary analyses. Um, so, so if you were to find the source articles through PubMed, let's say, um, we don't break down the groups and and look at you know the impact of of sex. Um, but I did do some some other analyses, sort of on the side. Um, generally speaking. No, um, you know, n there wasn't really a big impact of of one sex versus the other. Uh, although I think there was a bit of an association of um, females tending to uh, exhibit a little bit more deterioration relative to males. Um, but, um, you know, this is we're, we're also relying on my memory, which is terrible. And um, and I think it was a, it was a very small association. Uh, great, thank you. And then uh, next is a, que oh, a question about persistent depression following a, a TBI. So uh, does mental health deteriorate or improve in, after three years? Ooh, okay, great I question. I, yeah, I can't answer that second one, unfortunately. Um, you know, people, 
So we did have those depressive scores for the most part. Um, you know, we're talking across the three different groups, right? So, um, you know, a lot of a lot of what I can talk about will get washed out in group level analyses. So people tended to have some depressive symptoms, um, but generally speaking, on a whole, on a mean level analysis, people weren't depressed. But certainly, people within those groups are going to have been depressed. Um, notably, you know, and this is with the CSD, it's it's more like recent recall of depressive experiences. So, um, as far as answering that second part of the question, you know, does mental health deteriorate uh, or improve after three years? Hard to say. Excellent question. Um, and I and I think this this could be a really interesting, you know, research topic to flush out. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, certainly for anyone that might be interested, um, clinically, I do fall between the 2 sort of domains. Um, so it's well within my wheelhouse. Uh, I just don't have the answer. Unfortunately, um, and persistent depression. Um, I, I haven't looked into that, um, only because the, I was limited based on the measures at my disposal. Um, so the CSD is really looking at more recent, um, depressive experiences. Um, the CLSA does have a whole trove of questions and variables to look at mental health. Um, so again, I think it's you know a wonderful research question to uh, to dig into and try to understand. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions from our audience? We have a few more minutes left in the in the webinar. Okay. Um, so I guess if there aren't further questions, uh, maybe we, uh, we can wrap this up. You've uh, muted yourself, Mark. So, uh, um, I'll give you a minute. I know sometimes it takes a minute to type a question in. So in the meantime, I will mention to everyone, I'll give you a reminder that the, uh, the CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. So, um, uh, Shirley just shared in the chat with you the link to learn more about the data access process. And the next, uh, the next deadline for application is September 8th, uh, 2021. Um, and I would just like to remind everyone also to complete the survey located under the polling option. So in the bottom right, you have participants, chat, and then a new option appeared of polling. So under there is your survey of how the webinar was for you. So if you could take a couple minutes to fill that out, that would be wonderful. I'd like to uh, thank Mark very much for the um, for uh, participating in the webinar series. It's very appreciated, and I know you're very busy at the moment. So I uh, appreciate you taking the time to prepare and uh, and uh, shared your very interesting results with us. And I would like to remind you also that there's one more CLSA webinar this season. So it will take place in June and it's gonna focus on data linkage. And if you go to the, uh, the webinars part of the CLSA website, uh, details and registration information will be posted soon. And we invite you, those of you who uh, who use Twitter, uh, uh, just a reminder that this webinar series is pro uh, is promoted using the hashtag CLSA webinar, and you're invited to follow CLSA on Twitter at at CLSA under, underscore ELCB. So thank you so much, everybody, for um, for uh, attending the webinar, and we hope. Oh, there's oh, there's a question. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed a, I missed this question. One more for you, Mark. You thought you were off the hook. Uh, I wonder whether you compared anxiety and mood symptoms in the RCI study. So I think you sort of answered that, but if you could maybe just uh, just reiterate. Yeah. No, no, no. Great, great question. So uh, no, I, I, I didn't. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things that you know, as you develop the RCI, you got an index based on. Uh, improved versus deteriorated. So you could certainly run like a logistic regression um, to look at uh, whether, you know, some of those anxiety, those mood symptoms uh, implicate in, you know, whether someone maybe gets better or, or deteriorates and has worse cognitive functioning. 
Um, I didn't um, just because we had a, you know, we're talking about 10% of the people that tended to deteriorate. So it's not actually a huge sample. And so I didn't have a lot of power to play with. So I wanted to keep some of my other analyses. You're talking about, um, you know, uh, cognitive reserve, pretty, pretty focused on my research questions, mm -hmm. uh, which I was looking at social support. So not unrelated to mood and anxiety, as I'm sure we can all, you know, um, have some awareness of in this, in this pandemic and this lockdown. So, um, yeah, uh, indirectly, I can certainly comment that likely, I think there's something to be said there, um, but I can't definitively. Lots of opportunities for, for trainees to do studies. To do research on this. Okay, so uh, thank you very much to everybody, and I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. And I guess we'll see hopefully most of you in June for the the upcoming webinar. Thanks all. Great. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone.